I am totally blown away by the response I got to the last video, why you should learn to program the hard way. Some of you might not know this, but that video sat on YouTube for two full years before the algorithm picked it up and started promoting it. I didn't expect any of this to happen, and I was rather caught off guard. Most of all, I am stoked about the conversation in the comments section. We had a real conversation with constructive feedback, and it didn't devolve into tribal warfare. There were a few haters, but that's life. I wish them the best. Among the many good points made is the following, which I am paraphrasing because many folks made a similar version of this point. I agree that making a game engine is good if you want to be a game engine programmer or specialize in programming. But if you want to build your skills as a game designer, you should use a pre-existing tool. You won't be able to iterate on your game design ideas fast enough if you are too bogged down with lower level technical problems. I want to explore this point because it touches on so many aspects of the human experience. Should we be generalists or specialists? Can you improve as a game designer while also making some of your own tools? Can you walk and chew gum at the same time, or will you inevitably trip and choke on the gum? Although I appreciate the context of the question, I believe this line of questioning avoids the core problem of creativity, the fact that you need uninterrupted time, space, and emotional well-being to do anything creative at all. You can't ask for these things because the world, outside of your loved ones and supporters, doesn't want to give them to you. You have to be bold and take them for yourself. You have to be willing to be laughed at. Tools have very little to do with creativity. Emotions are king here, and that is what I will talk about. I believe that after watching this video, you will have a better understanding of creativity, and you will have a unique way to approach your work process that helps you choose what to focus on. With this new mindset, you will more accurately judge what is worth your time, and you will develop good habits that help you harness the wild animal that is creativity. In more ways than one, creativity is about mastering your human nature. It's about dealing with your fear of failure and your fear of being judged. In some respects, I believe I am uniquely qualified to talk about this subject because I have faced many fears, both immediately present and those of a more abstract nature. I want to take you back to the year 2011. I was sitting on a chairlift at Breckenridge, Colorado. It was midday, bright and sunny. If you regularly ride the terrain park, you would have called it a bluebird day. However, this bluebird day was different. I had spent the majority of the early season practicing and getting up the guts to do this trick, a double backflip. I don't have to enumerate the risks of this trick. Spinal cord injury, hospitalization, death, and paralysis are among them. But I knew the right speed for the jumps. I already took a few practice runs and cleared them with some simple straight airs. I was as ready as any human could be. After getting out my iPhone to put on a good song, I hit the jump, saw the world spin below me twice, and stuck the landing. My friend Katrina was there, and she congratulated me as I noticed my hands shaking from excitement. I finally did it. I conquered the one thing I had feared most. You might not know that I was pretty awkward as a kid. Not all that athletic. Roller coasters that go upside down used to scare me so much I wouldn't ride them, and I got left out of many social groups. So how did I get to a point where I did one of the scariest tricks in the sport of snowboarding? I obviously didn't just show up at the terrain park to do that trick on my first day. I didn't have any experience, and it would have been an instant trip to the emergency room. Of course, I can say the cliched thing that you'll hear at any Tony Robbins seminar. I worked really hard for five years. I tried many tricks and failed over and over again. All true. But ultimately, I believe it came down to building a healthy relationship with my fears, learning to sit with them and pick them apart. Why am I afraid of hitting this slightly bigger jump? I might not have the right speed. Okay, how do I figure out if I have the right speed? Well, I could watch people hit it. I could ride alongside it or side slip up it and then look over the edge of it just to get a feel for the speed. Why am I afraid of this backflip? Well, I've never gone upside down before on a snowboard. What if I go in the backcountry and build a little practice jump in the powder with lower consequence? What if I go train on a trampoline or a foam pit? That could work. I'll get more experience and comfort. It won't be such a big risk to me. Day after day, I saw many people show up to go snowboarding and not get good at the sport. 
This includes people who regularly ride the terrain park, people who, by all accounts, have the means and seem to want to get better at it. Many people would do the same tricks at the start of the season and the same tricks at the end of the season. Having witnessed that kind of behavior, it's really hard for me to not notice the exact same thing in the work world. People stay in the same jobs year after year after year, doing the exact same thing they did before, but with a slightly better title. In the software world, you start out as a junior engineer, and you end as a senior software engineer 14, with small incremental pay raises to compensate for inflation. It's not uncommon to spend your entire career duct-taping crappy mobile apps together with React Native, creating nothing of your own as you measure your life in JIRA tickets. Back in my snowboarding days, I remember seeing this one kid. He wore a tattered neon green hoodie with his dad's construction company's logo on it. He would start one season doing basic 360s with a grab, and he would end that season with perfect 720s. Soon he would be up to 1080s with a few inverted tricks thrown in for some extra style. By the time I left the snowboarding world, he was a sponsored pro doing double corks and winning competitions. I asked him how he got so good so fast, and here's what he told me. You need to scare yourself every day trying a new trick at the edge of your abilities. That's how you progress. Once you can do the trick, you practice and polish it. To me, it's obvious why he got so good. He took the necessary risks, and he put in the hard work to perfect his style. I've seen 11-year-old kids hit 80-foot jumps, and it's one of the most moving sights to behold. The confidence it inspires in them at such a young age that they get to live out the rest of their lives knowing they are this total badass and nothing will stand in their way. It damn near brings a tear to my eye and makes me think, you know what? The kids are all right. Creative people have many things to fear. The work world is mostly stacked against them. Although creativity is admired and valuable at the top of companies, it is rarely ever encouraged or appreciated at the bottom. Usually the easiest way to lose your job as a software engineer is to start getting creative to make decisions that differ from the existing patterns in the project you are working on. And creative people have the fear that others will see their work and reject it. And they're not wrong for having that fear because most things you make will suck until you get better at it. So you can expect to be made fun of. But I think above all else, there's just that gnawing fear of transforming a blank canvas, or in our case, a blank text editor document, into an actual game. People hate staring into that abyss. They'll do anything they can to avoid being specific about their game. And that is the reason why I think you see so many game developers making game engines instead of just making a game. It's comforting and easy to work on 2D pixel art rendering. The parameters are defined for you, and you just need to execute. It's much scarier to sit down and work out what's actually going to be in the game. What are the rules? What are the items? What are the core mechanics? Why is this something that the market wants at this moment in history? How is this different from the games that are currently on the market? What's the hook? If you aren't careful, this kind of thinking can easily take a darker turn. You might find yourself asking, what if nobody cares about this thing I'm making? What if I spend years of my life on it and it's all a total waste? What if I never come up with a good game idea? What if I run out of money pursuing this dream and I can't get a job afterwards? This necessary self-criticism could make you feel depressed and unmotivated. That's why I think so many game devs would prefer to avoid it. Although you can't ever gain complete mastery over it, it's important to recognize that it's not you having those thoughts. It's the fear saying those things. Now, you might think that, after landing a double backflip on a snowboard, I would be immune to this sort of thing. But I'm not. And that's the interesting lesson I learned from doing it. The fear never goes away. You will spend your whole life sitting with it. One year, I decided to quit one of my software contracting gigs and not collect a paycheck, just so I could give my full attention to designing a game. I built up a good chunk of the gameplay and put out a demo for some friends and fellow playtesters. They didn't like it. They played through some of the levels, but it could only hold people's attention for about 20 minutes. At the time, this was really scary. I had to accept that I didn't design a good game, and I needed to start over, all while thinking, gee, what if I can't get another job as a mobile app developer? What if nobody wants to hire me again because I'm disloyal, I get too bored, and I can't stay longer than a year? What kind of reputation am I creating for myself by doing this? 
None of those thoughts were rational, but that didn't stop me from having them. Of course, after that, I ended up finding another software contract, and it didn't matter anyway. Nobody cared about the sabbatical. But an interesting thing happened the moment I shelved that one game project. I started working on another game, Moose Lucians, and it got a slightly better reception from my audience. People played it much longer because the puzzles were better. This new game didn't have the same design problems as the game that came before it. By making that failed game, I learned a great deal about game design. And as soon as I abandoned that failed game, my improved game design skills started to show through in my next game. I actually pitched Moose Lucians to a puzzle game publisher. They liked the gameplay but wanted to fund something much larger in scope, and I didn't have a good plan to expand beyond the 38 puzzles I made for that game. Still, to me, that's a win. Somebody who likes puzzle games liked my game, and the only reason they didn't fund it was because they only fund games with much more content. I can solve that problem. In hindsight, quitting my job and pursuing a skill at the edge of my abilities was the best thing I could have done with that year, even though it didn't seem like it when I made that decision. That was a scary year, but it brought me one step closer to achieving my goal, to make a game that a large number of people love to play. Most programmers have a difficult time taking the leap from working a job to making their own products. Instead of facing the hard questions, they get mired in small technical details that don't matter at a high level. This is why I don't think you should make a game engine. If you are a programmer by trade, it won't challenge you in the way that you need to be challenged. And if your goal is to sell products to paying customers, you need to spend some time working on the customer-facing side of the business. Instead of making a game engine, you need to make a game. You need a rough idea of what gameplay will be in your game and how the mechanics of it work together to make a cohesive experience for the player. You need to know what genre the game belongs to, how it hooks the player, and the unique design problems a game like yours might have. It should be an idea for a game, as in a playable thing where you can look at the art assets on the screen, make a strategy, execute the strategy, and then fail or succeed. To me, making a game engine with no game in mind is like just going snowboarding. It'll be fun, and you might learn something, but it could easily devolve into an unfocused mess of random features you think you'll need for some game you might theoretically ship someday. Just like I saw so many skiers and snowboarders show up every day and accomplish nothing, I have witnessed a similar pattern among software developers. They like to fiddle around with code, but don't have a real product in mind. Many don't ship. As a matter of fact, I didn't really get into software development until I had my first good idea for an app. That's what drove me to learn it. Coincidentally, this was also back in 2011. The iPhone was growing in popularity, and I came up with an app that generates a random snowboarding trick for you to try in the terrain park. I called it Snow Dice. I had no idea how to program the thing. I created the first version of it using this horrible tool called PhoneGap, and I quickly got a working version out to my friends in about a day. They enjoyed the hell out of it, but I had a new problem. It didn't look good, and because it was built to work inside of a web browser using JavaScript, it had all kinds of jank. I made it available on the App Store, but nobody was buying it. Fast forward a few months, I made a skiing version, and I pitched the app to some major influencers in the ski and snowboard world. A pro skier who you may have heard of, Jossie Wells, agreed to promote the app, and ESPN wrote an article about it. We generated a great deal of buzz, but that created a new problem. The app still looked janky. To make the product better, I had to go one layer lower and ditch PhoneGap. So I set out to learn as much as I needed to learn about Apple's UI kit to improve Ski Dice. I had about three weeks to do this, so ha, uh, no pressure. On top of that, I had to quit my only source of income, freelance writing, so I could set aside the time to work on the product. Let me tell you, it's no fun to watch your bank account drain with no idea how it will fill up again. Thankfully, the goal of making this one small app focused my efforts. I was able to block out all of the UI kit features that weren't relevant to shipping a good-looking version of Ski Dice. I learned as much as I needed to learn to hit the goal. We shipped Ski Dice on time and made 500 sales in the first day alone. This was my first real product launch, and I distinctly remember spitting out my coffee the next morning when I looked at the sales. After that win, we took our knowledge and rolled it into the next product, Skate Dice, which was intended for a much larger audience. It gained widespread adoption within the skateboarding world and still makes money to this day. 
It's linked in the description. We reused a bunch of code to make skate dice, and it was only later on that I realized I was building a random trick generator engine. Most of the time, I was just making apps, repurposing the leftovers from the previous app to make the next. This is why I don't like the term game engine. To me, a game engine is just leftovers. The point is to make the game and to build whatever systems you need to build to get the game working in a way that satisfies you, the creator. So now I'm hearing you say, okay, Ted, this makes sense. Don't just build a hodgepodge of features, make an actual game. But what does that look like? How do you actually do that from scratch? You have to start with the gameplay. And that could mean working out some of the gameplay on paper or programming some small piece of the gameplay first. Let's use my most recent game, Moose Lucians, as an example. Moose Lucians is a 2D Sokoban style puzzle game where you play as a lumberjack wandering through a forest full of angry moose who charge at you. The game has puzzles where you need to get the moose out of the way, avoid the moose, or intentionally anger the moose to get him to go where you want him to go. If I were building this game from day one, I would start with the first puzzle in the game and try to make everything in that puzzle work as a sort of vertical slice. The first level in Moose Lucians is a puzzle where you have to anger a moose and get him out of the way. So let's start there. What problems do you need to solve to make this level work? As it turns out, there are many. You need basic 2D graphics rendering of some sort. You need a coordinate system and tile grid so you can draw the player, the moose, and the trees in specific locations on the screen. You need some way to gather input from the player, either from a keyboard or a connected game controller. You need a way to move the player based on this input, a way to make the moose react to the movements of the player, and a way to prevent the player and moose from moving where the rules do not allow them to move. You need a goal tile and a way to detect when the player has landed on the goal tile so you have the cue to load the next level. You need sound effects that play when you move the player, anger the moose, have the moose charge, and when you reach the goal. It's a long list, but you make the game by starting at the top of the list. Gameplay drives the whole thing. If it's not relevant to the gameplay, don't work on it. I like to think I got my work process from the comedian Jerry Seinfeld. He has some excellent bits of wisdom on creativity linked in the description. Seinfeld is a big advocate of setting a specific goal every time you sit down to work. Once you hit that mini goal, you're done. You can go take the dog for a walk or play a game, whatever you feel. So when I sit down to make games, I have the bigger goal of getting some piece of gameplay to work but it's usually broken down into many smaller goals that could be accomplished in a two to three hour work session. The other day I needed to make my game draw a world map of all the puzzles in Moose Lucians. My goal for the session was to see the entire world map being drawn. Once I did that, I was done for the day. I played with the dog. Sometimes I will spend an entire work session making one puzzle, and that's about as close as it gets to Seinfeld's writing process. A puzzle is a lot like a joke. Don't just sit down and work on your game. Have a plan for what you're going to do in that session, and then let yourself feel satisfied once you've hit your goal. This is all about regulating your emotions, and you need to find a way to stay motivated. This is what I love about Casey Miratori's Handmade Hero. He starts from zero and builds the game one brick at a time. If you start with the goal of making a generic game engine that could be anything, you quickly run into what I like to call blank page syndrome. You're just staring at your text editor with no clear structure, no objective, no focus. It's impossible to start. I sort of chuckle when I hear about game developers discussing their entity systems, like they are some kind of wizard who can see into the future. And I want to grab them and say, you don't know what your entity system is going to look like until you have specific entities in a specific game. You don't know what kind of rendering capabilities you will need until you decide on an art style for your game. You don't know what kind of event system you will need until your game has specific events happening to specific characters in your game. What the heck is an event if you don't know who or what it's happening to or where? It's a terrible idea to start with the generic. It's much better to start with the specific. Notice the commonalities and then build natural abstractions to support that. Write the code that will do the most specific thing you can think of and then find a way to package up the code so it can be reused, if it even needs to be reused at all. It's no different from that pro snowboarder kid's advice to me. Just get the thing working and then polish it. 
you have to understand that's the scary thing. That's the part most people get stuck on. That's where they enter analysis paralysis, overthinking what might or might not happen if they make this architectural decision or that one. To me, it's no different from the guy who hesitates at the top of the jump line, watching others hit the jump instead of hopping right into the action and embracing failure. In short, just make the game. If you can make your game with an existing tool that doesn't frustrate you, and you don't mind hitching your wagon to a third-party entity like Unity that could go bankrupt or make sketchy business decisions you don't agree with, you do you. I prefer to control as much of my business as I can. Not having the source code is a business risk I don't want to take. That said, dependence on third-party entities is clearly a strategy that works. Many people take that road, and I took that road when I hitched myself to Apple to make skate dice. It exposed me to some risk, but it was the right thing for that moment of my career. And in some sense, we all have to hitch our wagons to at least a few third-party entities. The real question is, which parts of the wagon and how much? I make games. The engine is the part that's left over when the game is done. When I am ready to work on my next game, I will repurpose my leftovers to make it, just like I have repurposed the leftover stories and footage from my previous life in the snowboarding world to create this video. In this way, I don't really believe that software architecture exists, and I never plan how my games will be programmed ahead of time. Architecture is just leftovers. I build my games piece by piece, system by system, until they're done. If a system needs to change to support something the game needs to do, I modify it until it does. In some cases, I change a system so much that it no longer resembles the original thing. I never do a complete rewrite because that's just throwing away the knowledge I have accumulated and that knowledge is valuable. So back to the original question. Can you improve as a game designer while also building up your technical chops as a programmer? If your goal is to be a game designer, is it less optimal to do this? I think you can become a better game designer while making games from scratch, but it comes with a caveat. You need to set some very rigid constraints for yourself so your creativity doesn't run wild and destroy your life. Build the game brick by brick, but don't go into too much detail early on. Start with low-fidelity art, like the Pico 8 version of Celeste or Slipways, also linked in the description. If people like the lo-fi version of your game, they will like the high-fidelity version. It's a good gauge for the size of your game's audience. I have made many small game prototypes since I became interested in making games, and most of them didn't see the light of day. It has been about seven small games since I started, and every time I finished a game or abandoned a game concept that wasn't working, I took the code and used it for the next project. I accumulated a bigger and bigger pile of leftovers that I lovingly call my game engine. It's a similar story with Jonathan Blow's game studio, Thecla Inc. He prototyped a bunch of game concepts, and every time he did, his knowledge and his existing code base grew. He eventually learned how to make hits, and he became very successful with Braid and The Witness. You might have heard of this other company, Epic Games. They made this thing called the Unreal Engine. It turns out they were a game company before they made game engines, and much of the original source code for the Unreal Engine started its life in a long series of games they made. That company is only worth like $11 billion now. The game industry has a long history of making bone broth from kitchen scraps. Some of the biggest companies in the business focus on game tools, not games. So if you want to hit the big time in games, you might consider following in Tim Sweeney's footsteps. Make enough games to know what you want in an engine, and then build a business around the engine. But you have to start where you can start, and that means making a game. I usually don't ship games that have very poor player retention. It's only recently that I have made a game I believe worthy of shipping to a wider audience, and that game is Moose Lucians. It is the first game I have made that can hold a player's attention for about 4-5 to five hours of real gameplay. There is no filler, just 38 puzzles designed with emergent gameplay, and moose shenanigans in mind. I am announcing my plans to finish the game and put it on Steam. Follow the link in the description to wishlist it, and you will be notified when the game officially launches on that platform. Now, I'm no rube. I follow Chris Zukowski's How to Market a Game blog, also linked in the description, and he says small puzzle games don't make that much money on Steam. He is right, and you should pay attention to the market research he does. That said, I just want to set a good example for you, my audience, and actually ship a game instead of making Tony Robbins videos about game development and snowboarding. I have zero expectations for revenue and am merely doing it to practice what I preach. 
I already know my next game will be so much better, especially after all of the lessons I've learned from making this one. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, smash the subscribe button. I will end with one of my favorite quotes from the science fiction author Robert A. Heinlein. A human being should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, con a ship, design a building, write a sonnet, balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve equations, analyze a new problem, pitch manure, program a computer, cook a tasty meal, fight efficiently, die gallantly. Specialization is for insects.